today to talk briefly over a complex, complicated t subject of the nitrogen cycle. Take it away, Ron. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I've been a slow background on me. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't, but I've been with Roar Co-op for the last two years, but I'm in the precision department there. Um, my boss is actually sitting right there, so he's going to be critiquing me. Maybe, so. Maybe just a little bit. Just glad you're doing it, not me. Yeah, there you go. Um, so now I help out with Owner's Acres there in Aurora, and we got several locations. Um, and of course, I help out a lot with Precision Ag helping guys educate them in agronomy and uh, crop scouting and all that fun stuff. So, but I've been around the Platte Valley for 20 years. Before that, I was in, uh, went to school out in Shatter State and um, did some scouting out in Scotts Bluff. Um, so, but I've been in the Platte Valley here for 20 years. So, um, so I've been exposed to a lot of different crops and practices. So um, it's, it's been good to be down here in the Platte Valley. And, Yes, today well, I'm going to be talking about the nitrogen cycle. Um, sounds like every four years you guys got to kind of get refreshed on this stuff and, and, and learn all about it again. And, you know, I think, you know, probably every time we, you have to learn this, someone might say, you know, it's, this is important to learn because, you know, we got to make sure we're putting our nitrogen out there correctly, right? And now nitrogen is at record highs, and so it's even more important. We got to put every drop in the right spot, right? So this is just a good refresher as far as how nitrogen works and, and what we got to watch out for. So we don't lose nitrogen because there's a lot of different ways that can happen. So, so let's dive in here. You know, first off, you know, what is nitrogen? You know, it's, it's, it's a major component of amino acids. And of course, those are the building blocks of, of protein from plants and animals. So we got to have it, okay? If we didn't have it, we wouldn't be here. Um, it exists in three forms that, that, that we deal with, and that's organic matter, or the organic portion, ammonium, and then the nitrate. Um, this one right here is uh, an organic form, of course. These are inorganic, and the plant can use these. Um, nitrogen levels, they depend on a lot of factors, okay? Some include, uh, include the crop removal, you know, manure applications, if we're putting too much out there, we might have some excess nitrogen. Mineralization can play a big part as far as how much nitrogen is available. Um, stabilizers, using stabilizers can, can help those nitrogen, um, ammonium nitrogen stay around a lot longer and be available to crop longer. So I want to be talking about a lot of these things. So um, I'm just going to hit on real quick here. Overall soil fertility. Is a big part. So if we're missing, if we're missing something out there, um, and we put too much nitrogen out there, or and say phosphorus is missing, for example, we're not going to get the best use out of our, of our nitrogen if we're missing something else. Okay. Hybrid selection is a big part. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, precipitation, managing precipitation and irrigation. And then the timing of applications is, is uh, real crucial with nitrogen management, okay? Um, I'll kind of get, I mean, you guys, these are a dime a dozen on the internet as far as these, these nitrogen cycle um, charts and graphics. Um, I'll talk about the atmospheric nitrogen a bit. I'll talk about um, how it's fixed in the atmosphere in a few ways. Um, I'll talk about legumes, um, organic matter I'll hit on, some manures. A little bit on uh, industrial fixation and how some of those gases get up in the atmosphere and, and how that affects us. So the biggest source of nitrogen is in the atmosphere, right? So we are literally walking through a soup of nitrogen. Can't see it, it's there, we're breathing in. But and luckily it's a, it's a nice stable form of nitrogen. So 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Um, does anyone know here any way that we can see nitrogen? We can't see it right now. Is there a way that we can see it? Anyone? Any ideas? Okay. Aurora borealis. Okay. So what you see here 
you guys understand what the rural borealis is and what happens during that. We get a lot of solar activity happening, a lot of high energetic protons coming into the, to the atmosphere through most, most of the time it's through the poles. And they come down on these little veins of magnetism right here. And we get these ribbons that form in some cases. This green right here is actually oxygen, but when, it's, when you get really high energetic events of activity, um, this purple down here is actually nitrogen. So if you ever see that, that's what that is, nitrogen. You'll see red sometimes, and that's above the ribbons. That's actually oxygen in a lower pressure uh, type setting. And all it is is high energetic electrons are hitting these atoms, knocking them off their kilter, and that emits a photon, and that's what we see. So probably just little things you're learning here that have nothing to do with the nitrogen cycle, but it's kind of neat. So. Organic matter is a, you know, we have our atmosphere, big source of nitrogen. Organic matter is another big source of nitrogen, okay? And a few things I want to point out here is organic matter, of course, it's, you know, it consists of a lot of different um, aspects. You know, we have stabilized, we have decomposing, fresh, we have living organisms. That all constitutes organic matter. And within that, all that matter at some point took up nitrogen somehow and stored in its body. All that is going to die, it's going to mineralize, it's going to decompose, right? And then we're going to get mineralization out of that, and we're going to get release of nitrogen, okay? The question is, is how much nitrogen, all right? So, for each about 1% organic matter, that releases between 20 to 30 pounds per season, okay? So let's break that down a little bit more. So at the top eight inches, that represents about 2.3 million pounds. From that, we get 23,000 pounds of organic matter per percent. 5% of that 23,000 is organic in, so it's not available, right? But 2 to 4% of that 5% is going to mineralize per season, okay? So that, this, that just tells us when you break it down like that, and I use 2%, I always use the minimum on mineralization, but when you break that down, 2%, that's about 23 pounds per percent of organic matter. So a lot of our soils have like 2%, 3% organic matter. So yeah, there's a good ch chance we're going to be getting 20, 60 pounds of, of uh, mineralized uh, uh, nitrogen from our organic matter. But you just put in that perspective, though, you know, there's over 1,000 pounds of organic nitrogen tied up per percent organic matter in the soil. So there's a huge reservoir. But, of course, it's just slowly available to us. So that's one source. Um, another source is manure. Uh, is there any manure guys in here? Maybe not, no? You got one manure guy there? What kind of manure do you use? Uh, I uh, consult with, I mean, litter, dogs, consult. Oh, a little bit of everything, all right, nice. So the big thing with manure is, um, Make sure you're sending that stuff into a lab, getting to analyze, knowing what's in there. Um, when it comes to nitrogen, you can see that, you know, your poultry litters, they're gonna have a pretty good charge of uh, nitrogen. So again, you gotta know, you know, what kind of tonnage am I putting out there? I don't wanna over apply the tonnage, especially with poultry manure, because uh, we'll put too much nitrogen out there in a sense, so we can lose it. Um, Another thing about uh, manures is if you stick that stuff on top of the ground, pretty good chance you're going to lose that nitrogen. It's going to turn into ammonia gas and you're going to lose it. So that's why it's important if you want to take advantage of that nitrogen source to work it in. And there's a lot of different ways. Some guys, dry manure is where you're really going to run into that problem or a liquid that you're spraying on top of the ground. But there's a lot of different ways of injecting in there. Some guys uh, run their pivots hog manure for instance and they run that affluent through the pivot and that gets worked in that way. So there's a lot of different ways but the biggest take home here is protect that nitrogen from volatilization. If you're putting it on top of the ground, get it worked in. Okay? And typically with nitrogen um, you're looking at about half of it is available per season that you put out there and then it kind of just tails off after that. After the years go by maybe 50% first year is available, and 15% the next year, and it just keeps tailing off. So. 
Legume fixation, um, it's another big one. And one thing to understand about the nitrogen credits with legumes is that um, nitrogen credits come from reduced immobilization of soil nitrogen associated with the decomposition of legume residue. So these legumes, they're going to take every single bit of nitrogen that's in that soil. They're not putting it back in. They're sucking it out and using it. They're putting it into the grain crop that we're producing. And that's where a lot of that nitrogen harvested. It's all about the decom decomposition of that legume residue that, with it. And usually this stuff has a, um, a low carbon nitrogen ratio, so it's going to break down faster. It's going to release that nitrogen a lot faster um, into our back into the into the soil. So it ain't putting nitrogen back in, <laughs> in a sense. So um, you know we got cover crops over here. We got these vetches in there. We got some uh, peas. Um, of course, we got our alfalfa and then our soybeans. So all these. All these crops fix nitrogen in some way. They take atmospheric nitrogen that seeps into the soil, and then there's bacteria down there that fix it in a symbiotic relationship with the plant. Okay. So I'm not afraid on uh, like soybeans, for example, to credit um, if it's on still loam ground. I'll credit 40 pounds of N on, on soybean ground. Um, Alfalfa, in some cases, the first year you can credit, it depends on how the quality of the stand, but you can credit up to 100 pounds uh, of nitrogen just from alfalfa. So, these, these uh, other days, cover crops, um, that could be, there could be a lot there. Uh, you'd, you'd have to find a nice chart that would show you exactly what they're going to release, but I'm guessing it, it might be in that 20 to 30 pound range. So, depends how long you let them go. I'll break it yet. Um, this is interesting. So whenever you look at one of them nitrogen cycle diagrams, you always see a bolt of lightning, right? It's like, how do we get nitrogen from a bolt of lightning? Well, there's a lot of energy in lightning, right? I mean, it's, it's hotter than the surface of the sun. So when it goes rips through the atmosphere, it basically splits all these nitrogen uh, atoms up. So your N2 is split up. And it's free floating around, and it's going to want to combine with something. And there's going to be there's going to be oxygen out there. That's the second most available element. It's going to combine with that oxygen and produce nitrogen oxide, right? So that nitrogen oxide eventually um, attaches to rain. And it turns into nitric acid, and it makes its way to the soil surface. And from there, it converts to nitrate after that. So it's not a huge source of nitrogen for our crops. But we do get nitrogen from the atmosphere. And just some white hat facts here, you know, we get 3 million lightning bolts per day, 13,000 tons of nitrogen per day. So that equates basically, uh, we get less than 10 pounds of nitrogen from lightning every year. But this is part of the nitrogen cycle, you gotta know. So, and usually lightning, when we get it around here, we don't want it. It's usually around that first week of July, and it's usually not a good thing. Right? A little bit more um, on the, the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, we also get, you know, from fossil fuel burning, we get uh, nitrous oxide from that. Uh, any kind of fuel burning, they have to put a tractor here, but that could be a, a freeway of cars, too, you name it. Um, so we get that, that stuff goes up in the air. Um, and it all blends in with the rain eventually, and it comes down to the earth, okay? So not all of it, but a, a good chunk of it does, so. This, this uh, little chart up here is from the EPA. I thought it was kind of interesting. Back in 2000, 2002, this is the acid rain um, measure, measurements they did. But you can see there's actually a 30% drop and the deposition of uh, acid rain from nitrogen, or nitric acid, because that's what's in our rainwater. So it was a 30% drop. You can really see on the east coast here through the midsection here, it really dropped over these years. So kind of an interesting little fact. But yeah, those nitric acid, that's in our rainwater, and you know, we have a little bit of sulfuric acid in there too. So water had a pH about five, six, five, seven. I don't know if you ever had hard water on your windshield before. Maybe you tried to wash it and bake those salts on. Then it rained the next day. The 
our windshield's totally clean. It's just that acid in that rain is just basically washing it right off. So. This is uh, probably one of the bigger ones that we deal with, and that's nitrogen from irrigation. And some guys not so much, but some guys a lot. Um, I do know there's some wells out there where they're getting 40 pounds of credit in nine acre inches. So that's a big substantial source of nitrogen they're getting from uh, irrigation water. Um, typically, uh, typically I, I usually figure that nine acre inches, nine acre inches, is what's being applied. I would really stress on uh, making sure your pivots are that you know what the volumes are going through. You know what your sprinklers uh, are packaged for. Always monitor that pattern on those pivots. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever taken a Google Earth image and just scrolled around the neighborhood and seen some of these pivots that are uh, showing some watering issues. Well, there might be a lot more water going on here than there. And you know that's affecting yield. And if I'm putting too much water on here, I might be leaching nitrogen away. Or it might be, be nitrifying, who knows. But if we can get a nice uniform uh, watering pattern on our sprinkler systems, that's going to help with the utilization of our nitrogen more efficiently. It's going to be a more even distribution. Um, know your soil moisture holding capacities, of course. Um, you know, that basically is what I'm saying there is don't over irrigate. Okay? You got a sandy soil, you don't put an inch of water on. Okay? I'm more like a half inch of water per revolution on sandy soil. Again, that's going to help. It's going to leave room for Mother Nature, number one. And number two, it's not going to leach out um, excess nitrate or you have some sulfates in there, too. So make sure you're not overwatering with the type of soil type you have. Know your ET rates. That's the next one right here. Um, you know, during the summertime, I'm always looking at how much water is going to be used per week. Is it two inches? Is it two ten? Is it an inch eighty? I always kind of have a good idea of how much watering, so I know this is my, how I'm going to strategize putting water on this week on my crop. Okay, so knowing your ET rates, and there's a good, there's a good, uh, there's good sources for that. Uh, I know the University of Nebraska has a bunch of ETs, uh, gauges in their network, and they usually have them. Give you a pretty good idea of what the water use is going to be for that week, so make sure you're, make sure you're knowing what your water use is. And another thing I would say here is, um, of course, use those probes out there. Um, probes are good for knowing how much moisture there is, but probes are also good for knowing where your nitrates are moving, or anything that's mobile. You know, borate is a mobile element too. Sulfate is about half as mobile as nitrate. But these, these probes will tell you that not only where's the water going, where's the nutrients going with that water. Okay, that, that's telling you, okay, we're getting below the root zone. <coughs> depends what time of year it is, depends where the roots are, right? So, but use those probes too, just to know where, not only where your water is going, but where your nutrients are going. Um, the next source, one that we know probably the best is the, the commercial nitrogen. And the Haber-Bosch process was developed back in, um, was it 19, early 20th century? 1913, I think. And so that was made in Germany by BASF. Or actually, BASF bought the process. Was, that's how you know, scientists make it. And then the company goes, oh, I want that. But it was made basically for Nazi, Nazi Germany needed a source of explosives. So this process was developed because they couldn't get salt here like the Allies could down in Chile. So the Nazis had to develop how to make a lot of anhydrous ammonia so they could get nitric acid, and that was one of the ingredients in bomb making. So the, because of <laughs> World War I, uh, we, got a, we got our uh, Haber-Bosch process uh, developed and ammonia gas production went online. And I think when they first started, it was about 20 ton a day is what they could do. But from that, from that, from that hydrous ammonia, you can see that hydrous ammonia is the feedstock for a lot of 
a lot of our nitrogen products. Okay, well, we got to have an higher ammonia that makes our urea. Monoammonium phosphate, diammonium phosphate. That's used. They react in hydrous ammonia with phosphoric acid to make these things. Um, they react in hydrous ammonia with sulfuric acid to make ammonium sulfate. Um, nitric acid, ammonium nitrate, and they, uh, in hydrous ammonia plus carbon dioxide. That's how we get our urea. And when, when we combine urea and ammonium nitrate, we get our UAN solutions. So ammonia is very important. We got to have it. Um, Kind of going back to the beginning here, they're just they're taking atmospheric air, remember that 78%, and they're combining with natural gas, methane gas, whatever it might be. They're taking basically the hydrocarbon off that, and they're linking that hydrocarbon up with the, the nitrogen molecule. So, but, but yeah, it's, it's good to understand that um, we get a lot of, most of our nitrogen that we apply, it comes from the atmosphere for, from this process. A um, few ways we can lose nitrogen. Um, one way is through volatilization. And, uh, that's, that's basically done by the, the urease enzyme. And you know, what the urease enzyme is, is it's actually excreted by microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, and it's a protein. And that protein acts as a, as a chemical catalyst in the conversion of certain elements. So we have all this urease, it's, it's on a residue, it's on soil surface, it's, it's everywhere, okay? When we apply, like urea, for, for, for example, that, that enzyme is there and it starts reacting with that urea, okay? And what's produced is ammonia gas and carbon dioxide, okay? That's why we use protectants on that. We use urease inhibitors, so we don't have that volatilization. Um, that, and that not only happens with like urea, but urea ammonium nitrate, UANs, because it has that component in it, the same thing can happen. Ureas can affect that and volatilize. That's why we protect it. Denitrification, um, that's the next one. So basically what's going on there is when the nitrification process happens, so that's basically when the, the bacteria converts the ammonium to nitrate, um, what happens is say you get some either tight soils, you get waterlogged soils, but no matter what you're doing, you're, you're reducing the amount of airspace in the soil. So it could be water or it could be really tight clay stuff going on. And when you take that air away, you're taking air away from the microbes that breathe that air. They gotta have, they gotta breathe just like we do, okay? And when they do run out of air, where are they gonna get their oxygen? Well, they're gonna take it they're going to take it from the, the, the nitrate right here, the NO3. They're going to strip that oxygen off, and what you have left is N2 gas. That's kind of interesting. In alkali soils, uh, N2 gas is, is the most prominent one loss. In, in uh, acidic soils, we get nitrogen oxide loss is more uh, dominant. So this 60 70 percent, so I was just basically saying when 60, 60 to 70 percent of pore space is taken up, that's when this stuff starts to happen, happen okay? And again, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be on ground that's flooded. It could be ground that's real high clay content, it's just packed in, and there's nitrate in there, and this happens, because the organisms, they need oxygen, so they're gonna take it to nitrate that's there. But then, of course, we got the, the leaching aspect here, which I think everyone knows what leaching is. Everything disappears below us. I kind of wanted to hit on just fertility in general and how not having or having one thing out of balance can affect nitrogen in a sense and its availability and, and, and its loss. So this guy here, you guys have probably seen this before, it's a, a Justice on Liebig, another German guy. Those Germans really had things figured out. They're, they're pretty smart people. I think I'm only about 50% German, so. But, they, this guy had it figured out. They, he had this process figured out in 1873. He learned that, you know, if something's deficient, that's going to cause, you know, something to happen. You got to have everything in sufficiency for good crops to, to do their thing and be the most efficient. So this guy had this figured out a long time ago. There were some other guys that came in later and said, hey, let's, uh, I think back in the 1940s, they said, hey, let's kind of get a model going like this. And, really showcase what this guy um, basically started to, 
what he came up with. So, you know, we've known about this for a long time. Uh, what I want to hit on here is the pH thing. Um, so here's our nitrogen, you know, here's the rest of the elements, but pH, pH is a big one that, that's, that's usually the first thing I look at on a soil test, so pH, where the pH is and if it's out of whack or not, because that's going to tell me a lot of things on any amendments that need to be put out there to fix that, or it could be a hybrid selection, from the right hybrid and the right pH kind of deal. So um, and if I get that right, I'm going to utilize my nitrogen a lot better. So this right here basically shows pH issues when they're out of whack. And again, we're going to concentrate on nitrogen here, but you can see when you get below that 6 pH, nitrogen starts tailing down, right? When we get above P, uh, a pH of 8, it starts tailing down. But man, we don't have a lot of soils above 8. They're out there. But I'd say this acidic soil is probably more, more uh, common uh, in our end. Than, uh, the, than the high alkali issue. So anyway, this is that sweet spot between 6, 5, and 7. That's where most things are, are, are most efficient. So again, if we get below that 6.0, you can start to think that, hey, the nitrogen I'm putting out there isn't that going to be taken up efficiently enough. And it might be because there's other elements like phosphorus that ain't in check, OK? Because the pH is out of whack. And that might inhibit more uh, nitrogen from being up. I mean, it's just, it's kind of a snowball effect sometimes. So, again, everything needs to be in check to get the most efficiency out of our nitrogen. Okay. Um, just, just so you understand, cations and anions, you know, we're talking positive, negative charged elements. And just, I'm going to just single out nitrogen here. Um, when it's a cation, it's in the ammonium form. It's got a positive charge. It's going to stick to the soil. When it's a... Uh, when it's an anion, it's a nitrate, uh, and it has a negative charge. Okay, and just so you know that, if it's negative again, it's going to filter through the soil. If it's positive, it's going to stick to the soil. All right. This illustrates CEC. Okay, the CEC is just a measurement of the, the, the soil's ability to hold nutrients. Okay, so the higher the CEC, the more nutrients I can. Well, I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out pH again here. So, whoops, sorry. So you see this clay um, colloid here. So clay, clay can hold a lot of nutrients. Okay, if you, got, if you got a lot of clay, so it's going to hold a lot of nutrients. Sand, not so much. But as you can see here, we got some sodium, magnesium, calcium, potassium, calcium, whatever. Right here, we got some ammonia. There's some ammonium there, ammonium there. What are these little guys here? Those are hydrogens, right? Here's some hydrogens on the sand. Now, the hydrogen's taking up space, okay? That's space that this, this positive ammonium can be attaching it to. So again, it all goes back to getting your pH correct. So your ammonium has a place to stick, okay? And knowing what your CEC is and getting your pHs in check, you know, the higher the CEC, the more nitrogen you can hold, okay? Because there's just, there's just more bonding sites, all right? So, CEC is another big one that I would um, consider when it comes to nitrogen management and making sure my pHs are in check again. Um, understanding nutrient uptake. Um, you know, most of our nutrients are taken up through a process called mass flow, as you can see right here. Mass flow is just basically when that, when that element is in solution, and the plant sucks it right up. Now we do have a few elements on here like phosphorus and potassium. They're, they, they're, they take up by diffusion, so that's from areas of higher to lower concentration. And that happens right close to that root here. They, the elements do not travel very far. So anyway, I guess my point here is, is to make sure that you know how nitrogen gets in. And it's through mass flow. Every time we do a watering event or every time it rains, we're basically simulating a mass flow event. And so with that comes the nutrient uptake curve. Um, there's a bunch of them on here, but again, I'm just, we're just for nitrogen sake today, we're going to talk about the nitrogen uptake. And you know, as you can see here, 
So if I put a whole bunch of my fertilizer on early in the season, a few months away, and most of my nitrogen, nitrogen is being uptaken during, uh, right after B10, around that 1,000 GDUs all the way up to, to silky, and we start having our cast of cob and leaves, all that stuff is, is being developed here. Most of our nitrogen, half of our nitrogen is after that time frame, okay? So if we can time our nitrogen more to these in-season times when the crop is taking up the most, we're gonna get the most bang out of that investment. We're gonna utilize our nitrogen better. And the more we utilize our nitrogen better, usually we can bring that nitrogen uh, use factor down a little bit more even too. If I was putting all my eggs in one basket in the fall, I'd probably put a little bit more nitrogen on. Nitrogen is expensive. I don't want to put a lot of nitrogen on. But just take that into account. You know, when is the crop going to use it? I want to put these products out there when the crop's going to use it. Okay? And we got a lot of tools to do that now, right? We got pivots and we got some fancy wide drop machines and stuff that can do that. So I'm just going to sum things up here. Again, I think the take home here is protect and manage your nitrogen. You know, protect it with the stabilizers that are out there. Um, and then manage it properly. So use nitrification inhibitors. Uh, use urease inhibitors if you're sticking that urea on top of the ground or UAN on top of the ground. You know, split apply that nitrogen when the crop needs it the most. You know, apply nitrogen before cru crucial crop stages. You know, make sure it's make sure it's out there early for that plant right before it's starting to turn rows around is of course if we put more kernels on it it's going to utilize more nitrogen right it's going to pack more into that 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 ear so we got to make sure we enhance that time period make sure that plant has all the nutrition it needs at that time frame um, choose a choose your proper hybrid for soil pH and fertility conditions you know that's a big one I think any of your seed guys out there they got to be good agronomists I mean they got to know their soil science too and some of these hybrids are really specific to certain types of soil conditions. Some like high pH, some like low pH, some like really fertile ground, some don't. So if you put that hybrid on the wrong piece of ground because of some odd thing off in that, in that soil sample, you're going to see a reduction in yield. Okay? But you might have fertilized for 280 or whatever it might be, but the hybrid does 250. Well, that's 30 pounds out there because you had the wrong hybrid that you missed out on. So then that 30 pounds does whatever it does. It might leach. Who knows? But hybrid selection is a huge part now of managing our nitrogen properly. So know your soil samples. And I would say with that, grid sampling. Grid sampling is probably bar none, the, the best way to know what your nutrients are on the field. So keep up on your grid sampling. Use cover crops if necessary, of course. You guys with, I mean, it works on most most situations, but, um, you know, the guys on seed corn stuff, I, mean, I think it's most important on seed corn stuff for the most part, um, especially if they have wind events or something like that. Soak up that extra nitrogen. That, that cover crop is going to break down and it's going to feed subsequent crops so and then we're it, I mean it's, it's keeping that nitrogen too from going where it need, doesn't need to go which is down and leaching so and again credit all nitrogen sources um, I'd label a lot of nitrogen sources there so just make sure you're crediting them and, and then play with that nitrogen factor you know as far as how many pounds of them per bushel you know and I think like I said before if you if you use stabilizers if you if you split your nitrogen up put it on and get it on during important times. You're going to get the most yield you can out of those hybrids. Make sure that hybrid is, is matched up well with that piece of ground. Um, and you'll see good things. Those crops will, if we grow good crops, it uses the nitrogen we put out there, right? And so we don't lose any nitrogen. So that's all I had for you guys. Thanks. Anybody have any questions or anything? Dive in pretty deep topic. I have a question about leaching. What, what are the, is overwatering the water the one way uh, leaching? What causes the leaching? Or are there other variables? Yeah, as soon as that nitrogen is in the, in the nitrate form, it, it depends too on the 
on your soil type. And if it's staying to your ground, yeah, it's going to leach. It's just, it's all about watering. And it's where that root zone is too. So you're in horticulture, so you're in grass. So if you're on a bluegrass lawn, you might have shallower root systems. And if they're over watering on their yard, they're going to push a lot of those nitrates past that root zone. So more frequent waterings. I would encourage people to use more of the slow release nitrogen on their yard. I just think that's a no brainer if they can. Or tweak their tweak their uh, nitrogen applications down a little bit on the volume, maybe 0.7 pounds every time they field across or something like that. So, but yeah, it's it's all about overwatering and you know, big two inch rainstorm comes along too, it doesn't. So the nitrate form is going to leach or can leach. Is there a simple way to calculate the pounds of nitrogen you might get out of irrigation water uh, based on, say, water test? Yeah, so if you take that water test in, you'll get an analyze, and they, they should tell you how many pounds you're getting per acre inch. But yeah, there is a calculation that does that. Because yeah, you might put on 10 inches. <laughs> Some of that's extra goodie, though. It depends what's you know in your because there's a lot of there's extra goodies that we don't take account, like like you know from rain or something like that. There's ten pounds they're tossing in there. It's just extra goodie. Sometimes mineralization is extra goodie. Sometimes we get a little bit more mineralization than 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 what we think we might be. So, um, that was going to be my question: was environmental, you know, effects, you know, the spring of nineteen. Summer of 21, you know, and its impacts on mineralization and availability of nitrogen. Spring 19. That was the that was the rain. That was a flood. That, that flood. was a flood. flood. Well, one thing about that is the grounds froze. Yeah. True. And so, the only nit nitrogen would be anything that was sitting on top of the ground that might have been spread that might have washed right. away. We you know, at the NRD we did see an influx of chemigation permits that year. Where guys that said they put their nitrogen down early, it was it was getting ahead of the root zone, so they were needing to come in and do some rescue, you know, chemigation applications to try to mm -hmm. hurry that corn along to get down into that nitrogen as it was moving through the root zone. And, I think, and even the difference between say August of twenty compared to August of twenty one, we had incredible sunlight and heat this yeah. year. Just look at this fall. Look at what's happened. Yeah. We haven't froze up yet. No. I mean, I'm definitely. Gonna, I've already pulled nitrate tests. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pull on our research farm back in the spring again because I know there's a mineralization that typically we would not get that's occurred over the last 30 days of being. Yeah. Look, yeah. Nice weather. I, I, I was just looking at four four inch soil uh, uh, temperatures. A lot of these areas have been putting on higher snow now. Yeah, there's been some days where it's about 50, you know, and that's kind of the trigger point where those microbes start breaking things down. So, yeah, that, that's where you know, getting a stabilizer in there with the with the ammonia. To, it's an it's a really good insurance policy. Um, so, yeah, it's I mean, even next week looks like it's going to be warm a few days too. So, we're going to pay for it eventually, though. <laughs> Probably get a massive snowstorm to seal things up. Well, thanks, Ron. Thank you guys for sitting through this session. Um, we will take a short break to allow people to move, you know, to your next speaker that you're interested in hearing. Um, in this room, we do have Dr. Layla Kuntel with the University of Nebraska to talk about some different nitrogen management strategies um, and tools that are out there now for, for producers to take advantage of. And there's coffee, um, and there should be roll or some snacks in that large room where we met first thing this morning. Yeah, and, and anybody with a highlighter can, can check off your cards that you are in this session. Do you have CCA credits then to for them? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. And that's on their your registration card. I think it's just a yes or no. If you check yes on there, we will submit your name and the sessions that you attended to the Nebraska Agribusiness Association. 
so you guys could can receive credits. Um, and I'm trying to think what else is, if there's anything else on that form. I think that's the biggest one that's new this year. And, and what we'll do is at the end of the day, when you guys leave, you'll just drop those cards off at the station that you checked in at. Thank you.